Good day everyone. We're back here with the science lesson. I am Mr. Quraish and my colleague is here. He will introduce himself. We're looking at the body systems. Remember we revised uh, the things we've done in grade 7, that is the sense organs. We looked at the eye, the ear, the nose, the skin. And uh, then we went on to grade 8 where we looked at some body organs. The heart, the lungs, the intestine, the stomach, the liver, and so on. So then we started with uh, the body systems. We've looked at the digestive system. Uh, we looked at digestion and uh, the process of digestion, the end products of digestion. So now we move on to the respiratory system. Now, taking a look at the picture, we can see the major organs and tissues that are involved in the respiratory system. Um, the lungs, very obvious, two lungs, one on the right and one on the left of the uh, body. And then we can see the ribs forming the rib cage. The diagram at the bottom is a diaphragm, the one that looks like a flap of sheet. And if we move upward, we have the trachea. And uh, the upper part of the trachea, you have a bony structure, which we refer to as the larynx. So again, like I emphasized in the, in the other class, you need to uh, make sure you know the location of these organs, the names of the parts, and the functions of each of the parts. And uh, most importantly, you should be able to identify a system. In this case, this is the respiratory system. So what is respiration? We say it's a process which usually involves the use of oxygen in the chemical breakdown of food to release energy. Take note, the key word there is release energy. So when food is broken down in the presence of oxygen and energy is released, this is known as respiration. And um, there are two stages. You have the external respiration or simply breathing. Breathing is pumping oxygen-rich air into the body and pumping the exhaust air out of the body. Uh, it is common to say pumping oxygen into the body and pumping carbon dioxide out of the body. It's okay, but to be more precise, you're pumping air into the body and this air is rich in oxygen and the one you pump out is not so rich in oxygen and then, of course, it's having more carbon dioxide compared to the air you take in. That is followed by the internal respiration which is the chemical breakdown, the actual chemical breakdown of food inside cells and tissues to provide the energy. Now, we have the cellular respiration formula. You need to know, most importantly, the word formula, which is glucose plus oxygen producing carbon dioxide plus water and energy. Now, in some instances, you might be required to know the chemical formula which is uh, you can see the formula for glucose there c6 h12o6 plus oxygen six molecules of oxygen that is 6o2 yielding or producing six carbon dioxide six co2 plus six water molecules six h2o plus atp atp stands for adenosine triphosphate when you do higher science or biology uh, you'll be meeting that word. That's the energy that is produced. And uh, again, we take a, another glance at the respiratory system. So, how do we get air into our body? The air passes through the nostril, and then it will, next place it will be reaching will be the uh, pharynx, that is where the tube from the mouth and the tube from the nose where they meet. And um, then you have a flap of tissue called the epiglottis that is very useful when you want to swallow so that you can't, because you can't do the two together, you can't breathe and swallow at the same time. So the epiglottis will help to make sure when you're swallowing, it blocks the, the trachea so that whatever you're swallowing, food or drink, it doesn't go into the, um, the trachea. We normally say you don't want it to go into the wrong area. So the trachea we can see as we describe in the other lesson, 
uh, it's broke or it's divided into the broncos and uh, each broncos if you look at a little bit on the left of the diagram you can see the broncos divided into tiny branch like uh, structures um, so you can see the broncos further divide and divide until you have the bronchiole that the tiny branches and at the end of the um, bronchiole if you look at the picture left on the bottom okay they've zoomed in that is they've made the picture larger so you can see the uh, alveoli one is alveolus okay and uh, you can see the alveolus is surrounded by blood vessel and um, of course these are the capillaries so they must be very close to make a um, exchange of gas very efficient and the picture at the bottom right you can see oxygen that is uh, coming from the alveolus going into the blood vessel and then that is what is taken around the body so that the cells and tissues can carry on respiration and carbon dioxide which is the waste that is produced is taken back to the alveolus and from the alveolus it goes backwards to the bronchioles then to the bronchus the trachea and out through the nostril that is how we uh, achieve breathing um, once again the respiration equation it is glucose plus oxygen which gives you energy in the form of atp carbon dioxide and water the glucose is from the food we eat so all the foods you eat, mostly the carbohydrates, they end up in glucose. That uh, gives you, that is the glucose that is going to be combined with oxygen. Where do you get the oxygen from? Of course, from the air. And uh, the energy, it is used for all the cell activities, muscle contraction, breathing, like we're talking now. Energy is used for that. So you have to know this formula of head. Um, these are experiments to enable us to demonstrate how we breathe. Um, you have a glass tube that rep uh, represents the, you know, the thoracic, the chest cavity. And then uh, you place a tube with a fork, um, a Y-shaped something. Uh, you tie balloons to both ends of the, 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 the tube. And uh, at the bottom, you will tie a piece of um, uh, elastic uh, maybe like something from a balloon and then um, you can see on the left now how we breathe it is when for for air to come into our body we have to look at the right hand side you know the diaphragm which is represented by the blue sheet in the diagram there has to go down and our chest will rise and uh, go up and when that happens air is sucked in through the tube you can see the tube there represent the trachea okay so air is sucked in and you can see the balloons fill up and the reverse is when you release the sheet at the bottom the blue sheet then that kind of reduces the volume and you will see that the balloons decrease in size because once the volume is decreased that pushes the air out of the balloon why is this happening because the air pressure in the balloon has been reduced it's lower than the air pressure that is outside the body on the right by increasing uh, the the by increasing the, the 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 volume you have reduced the air pressure so air from outside is forced in while on the left you have uh, increased the air pressure so air is pumped outside the body this is how we breathe um, how do we demonstrate that it is carbon dioxide that is going out when we breathe and uh, it is oxygen that is coming in let's take it from the left we have two tubes that is set up and then you have uh, i mean test tubes and then you have tubes that go deep down now you have lime water in both tube a and tube b so you can see at the top there where it's written mouthpiece that is where you'll be breathing you have to uh, hold your nose so that no air goes in or out through your nose you only breathe through your mouth so you just try to breathe normally and what happens when you want to breathe in air is sucked on the left it goes through the tube a and then it passes through the lime water goes out of the tube and then it goes into tube b and then it is exhaled outside so why are we using lime water because it's the chemical that we can use to demonstrate that the air that we exhale is carbon dioxide it's because when carbon dioxide comes in contact with lime water which at the start was colorless but after addition of carbon dioxide it becomes 
milky, you know, like a cloudy substance. So that's the simple drawing to demonstrate the gases that we breathe in and breathe out. Um, the composition of air during respiration, this is a very important uh, table that you need to uh, try to remember. Um, you can see on the left, we have the main components of air, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor. Now, of course, uh, temperature is not part of the air, but um, we're looking at the temperature of the air that we inhale and exhale. So inhaled air, let's look at the amount of oxygen is about 21%. And when you exhale, the amount of oxygen is reduced. Now it's 16%. All right? And let's look at carbon dioxide. The amount you inhale is 0.04. That's almost like nothing or less than 1%. But then the one you breathe out is about 4%. And uh, we look at nitrogen. What do you observe? 79 coming in, 79 going out. So the amount doesn't change. And the water vapor, it's, uh, what we inhale is variable, meaning it depends on the atmosphere. Sometimes there's a lot of moisture in the air, sometimes it's very dry. Uh, but the amount you breathe out is always constant. You breathe out air with a lot of water vapor. And the temperature of the um, air you breathe in, again, very depends if it is, your surrounding is uh, you know, having a lower temperature, that is, it is cold or it is hot. So air we um, breathe in can vary, but the air we breathe out is around 34%, which is uh, closer to the body temperature. Uh, you'll notice I didn't mention much about the alveolar air. I don't want to confuse you about those things. Okay, so let's move on. Aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, very important. Aerobic respiration, we say it involves the use of oxygen and aerobic without oxygen. Uh, example, when we use yeast in a, an anaerobic respiration, uh, this is used when they want to break down sugar in the production of, uh, in some instances, alcohol and so on. Now, the pro waste products that we get from the breakdown is alcohol and carbon dioxide. Also, in baking, uh, an anaerobic respiration goes on. You know, when you mix your flour and the water and everything to form the dough, you cover it so that means you don't want oxygen there and then the yeast will work on that and they produce a lot of carbon dioxide which is very good because the trapped air the carbon dioxide makes your dough to rise and when you heat it it rises even more and that makes the food very soft and of course it looks palatable it looks large which uh, makes our appetite better um, also, in the human muscles, <clears throat> at certain times we do very strenuous work or exercise in which uh, the oxygen and the glucose demand goes beyond what the heart and the lungs can supply. So the body takes what we refer to as a shortcut. In that sense, it is going through anaerobic respiration. So it doesn't wait for the oxygen and the glucose to come, so it is uh, doing a shortcut and in this case, a lot of chemicals that we call lactic acid is built up. This is why when you do this type of work, especially if you've not been practicing, you feel a lot of pain in the muscles. But after the exercise, the respiration has to be completed. Your body will now continue to break down this um, lactic acid and uh, to the normal carbon dioxide and water and uh, you get back to normal. So that is an aerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. Aerobic, aero means air, so with oxygen or with air. And aerobic without air or without oxygen. Next, we want to look at the circulatory system. Uh, taking a good look at the photo, you can see the heart and the blood vessels. Uh, what is missing is the blood itself because the circulatory system is composed of the blood, the blood vessels, and the heart. Um, here on the right, you can see um, a beautiful photo of a heart and uh, you can see the main or the major blood vessels and their tiny branches. Composition of blood. <clears throat> um, if blood is taken from an individual and then this blood is spawn in a test tube at a very high speed, usually they have a device they call centrifuge. It spins it very high speed. 
that forces the heavy particles, that is the blood cells, at the bottom, and the liquid part remains at the top. The liquid part is what we refer to as the plasma. It forms about 55% of the blood. Now, a tiny portion that forms the white blood cells and the platelets, uh, you may not even see it properly in the diagram, that is the white blood cells plus the platelets, they form only about 4%. The rest, which forms the red blood cells, is about 41%, and it is the one that makes the blood red. So that's the composition of the blood. And of course, um, each, we are supposed to look at the functions. Now, the plasma is where all the substances, the food, the nutrient, the nourishment, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, everything, um, even when we take injections and so on, this is where they all get dissolved. So they contain or they provide a means of transporting the substances that the cells of the body need. The white blood cells are our defense mechanism. Uh, you have different types. There are those that go and eat other organisms like bacteria. And there are the ones that uh, produce chemicals to neutralize the chemicals that germs like bacteria bring into our body. And finally, we have the red blood cells. Their function is mainly to transport oxygen around the body to the different cells and tissues that need them. Uh, the blood vessels, mainly we have the arteries and the veins. Now, this blood vessels divide up into tiny branches, you know, and these tiny branches keep on dividing and dividing until we have uh, what we call the capillaries. So let's take the artery on the left and uh, take a careful look. You can see the tube inside, the space inside is very small, but then you can feel or you can see that the artery itself looks, the walls, they look fat and thick, okay? Uh, compared to, if you look at the vein, the blue one, uh, you can see the space inside is large and hence the wall is very thin. So that is one simple difference between the artery and the vein. There's another difference which we can't obviously see from this diagram. Um, the veins, they have valves. Valves are flaps of tissue that prevent the blood from going in the wrong direction. They allow the blood to flow only in one direction. We mentioned that in the previous lesson. Capillaries are the very smallest blood vessels. Uh, they are the ones that surround the blood, I mean the cells of the body, bringing nourishment, oxygen, and taking waste like carbon dioxide and other waste. So they, we use the word bathe or wash the, the cells so that everything they need um, is available and what they don't need is taken away. Um, you need to understand the way the blood is moved around the body. We divide it into two. We say there is pulmonary circulation, that is circulation of the blood from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart. And then we have the systemic circulation, that is circulation from the heart to the rest of the body and again back to the heart. So there are, that's why we describe the heart as a double pump, because it pumps to the lungs after which it pumps to the rest of the body. Uh, so it is important we try to memorize, I mean, learn the names of um, the different, um, the names of the blood vessels that supply some important organs or parts of the body, and also the ones that take blood from those parts of the body to the, back to the heart. So let's go to the lungs. It's very easy to remember uh, the lungs Blood vessels relating to the lungs, we describe them as pulmonary. And remember, generally we say, blood vessels that take blood out of the heart, we describe them as artery. And those that bring blood back to the heart, they are veins. So if we go back to the lungs, the blood vessel to the lung is a pulmonary artery. The one coming from the lung back to the heart is a pulmonary vein. Uh, let's go to the liver, somewhere in the middle. Now you can see for the liver, we describe them as hepatic. So the one bringing blood to the liver is a hepatic artery. The one taking the blood away, hepatic vein. Uh, come down to the kidneys. It is, the word is renal. So you have the renal artery bringing blood to the kidney, renal vein taking the blood out. Of course, there are other blood vessels. 
But one that is also very important is the one linking the intestines and the stomach to the liver. Remember, we said after digestion, the food is taken to the liver so the liver can check them properly and where it is necessary, adjust them. Like the glucose, uh, they check it. If it is too much, it is converted into a form that the body can store that is called glycogen. And for amino acids, if it is more than what the body can use, it is further broken down into urea and a form of carbohydrate that is also stored as glycogen. The urea is sent to the kidney so that the kidneys will combine it with other waste, extra water, extra salt and other things that the body doesn't want. And that forms urine which is sent out of the body. And that link is the hepatic portal vein. So it's also very, very important. Now, you will see a little box uh, showing red, that is vessels that are transporting oxygenated blood, meaning blood that is rich in oxygen. And the blue are vessels that are carrying deoxygenated blood. It's very easy to remember. The right side of the body, that is the left on your screen, carries the oxygenated blood. We're not saying the whole right side of your body is uh, deoxygenated, but what we're trying to say, uh, if you look at the heart or the blood vessels coming to the heart, they are coming to the right side of the heart and they carry deoxygenated blood. Those coming to the left side of the heart, they bring, I mean, they take the blood away and that is the oxygenated blood. A common question is, why does blood go to the lungs? The blood is going there to collect oxygen. Um, that is the little one, the, um, the let's call it mauve color or purple color. These are the vessels that are involved in gas exchange. That is where um, oxygen is given to the blood vessels and carbon dioxide is collected. Okay, let's look at the human uh, reproductive system. <clears throat> we earlier on looked at the organs involved and um, when we looked at it, we saw that um, it's made up of different parts. Um, let's look at the important areas, okay? Uh, again, to refresh our memories. Remember, I always say you must be able to identify the parts, uh, label these parts, and uh, you'll be required to identify also the system. So in this case, this is the male reproductive system. In some instances, they might bring the female reproductive system. So the scrotum, that houses the testes, the testes that are responsible for producing uh, sperm cells. And I uh, hope you can remember the epididymis, where the sperm cells are stored and where they mature. And then the vast difference, or the sperm duct, that takes the sperm uh, right through to the other tube, that is the urethra, so that it can be taken out of the body. Um, you have those three tissues or organs um, that help in producing um, materials that uh, would help to provide a means of uh, movement for the sperm cells, the prostate, the cowpa, and the seminal vesicles. And remember we said all these liquids together mixed with the uh, sperm cell form the semen. Of course, uh, the urethra passes through the penis and uh, the urethra, don't forget, serves two functions. One is, of course, the discharge of semen and the other is for the passage of um, urine. The female reproductive uh, system, we, put, we make it very simple. Uh, so basically we have the uterus, we spoke about it this morning. Um, we have the cervix, they normally describe it as the neck of the womb or the neck of the uterus. Uh, we have the ovary, we have the arms or the tubes through which when egg is released they pass through and of course the vagina. So something very important is the stages in development in young boys and girls. Uh, around the ages of 11 to 14, uh, they enter into adolescence and uh, another term we refer to as puberty. That is when they begin to experience changes. So we can see for girls, um, they, are, they have some earlier physical changes. Um, they develop earlier than boys. Uh, they become bigger, they become taller around the ages of 9 and 10. So if you have a boy and a girl that are born at the same roughly age, at around that age the girl appears to be growing faster than the boy. 
um, they have um, the breast will develop and the hips of course begin to widen they become bigger they experience uh, menstruation that is the monthly flow of um, unfertilized egg with blood and uh, which normally uh, is like a sign that this child is ready for reproduction um, but then they have to wait because some other body parts are not quite ready they are not quite developed and of course the reproductive organs also growing and maturing and uh, becoming uh, bigger then the ovary starts to function and produces eggs and they have a lot of fat which uh, you know makes gives them those, all these calves and so on and for the boys um, you know initially the girls left them behind but uh, two to three years later around the 11, age of 11 to 12 they now take over they grow taller they grow bigger develop bigger muscle tougher uh, the chest becomes very broad and wide and their skin is a little bit rough and of course they are active they begin to produce um, some of these uh, things like we call pimples they develop moustache uh, they have hair on the face and uh, they also develop hair in the armpit and the pubic or the reproductive area but don't forget uh, the girls also development or production of hair in the armpit and the pubic area is common to girls as well at that age. Um, we're looking at the menstrual cycle in uh, the girls or women. Now, this is a cycle that operates roughly around uh, 28 days. Now, once the girl has reached that age that is described as menac, okay, the age at which they start to experience menstruation, uh, what happens is, if you look at the circle, you'll see towards the top right, um, the, the wall is beginning to become thick and thick and thick. And by the time we go to the top left, it has reached the thickest level. This is the wall of the uterus or the womb that is becoming thick with blood and some tissue that is ready to welcome a fertilized egg, which will develop into a baby. However, if the egg is not fertilized, then this wall that has been building up breaks down. And that is what we refer to as menstruation and this is the cycle describing it pregnancy it occurs when an ovum is fertilized by a sperm cell the fertilized ovum is called a zygote um, it attaches itself to the wall of the uterus and uh, a placenta a kind of tissue forms between the mother and the developing baby the developing baby is now called a fetus uh, the baby and the mother are connected by the placenta. I mean, they are connected, the baby is connected to the placenta by means of um, a kind of tube with blood vessels in it that is called the umbilical cord. Now, this cord is very important because it's the lifeline of the baby. Uh, everything that the mother should supply to the baby, mostly nourishment and uh, uh, oxygen, and also for the baby to take out waste and everything is done through the blood vessels in the umbilical cord. So these are the stages in development. Uh, remember, we're talking about a sperm cell and an egg cell or ovum coming together. And once they come together, they become one. So if we take it from the top left, next thing that happens, the one cell that has been formed, which is the zygote, becomes two. They divide to form four and the number keeps growing from four to eight, eight to 16, 32 and so on until they form a ball. Uh, from the ball, tissues begin to form and uh, by the something around the um, 12th week, a fully formed baby is formed. So what is left now is for the baby to grow. You can see the stages and up to the last picture you can see at the bottom is a full fully grown baby that is ready for delivery. Um, the period between conception and the birth of a baby, we call it gestation. Conception means when uh, an, uh, an egg is fertilized by a baby. But for this to happen, the uh, sexual intercourse must occur or must have taken place. But of course, it's even possible for a fertilization to take place without sexual intercourse because now the sperm can be obtained and introduced into the womb of the mother or the fallopian tube to be precise because that is where 
fertilization takes place? It's a very important question sometimes. Where does fertilization take place? It takes place in the fallopian tube. Uh, in some instances, they can obtain the egg from the ovary of the woman and they can obtain the sperm cell from the testes of the male and they can join or mix these two in a, petri in a small dish and uh, once the fertilization has taken place and an embryo stage has been reached, that is a baby is beginning to form, they can now put this back into the womb of the mother and then that can grow. But that's another topic. Uh, usually that is done to help parents that are unable to have babies the normal way. So let's go back to our lesson. In humans, uh, gestation lasts for about 40 weeks. Uh, that's about nine months, eight to nine months, after which the process of birth takes place, which takes place in three stages. Dilation, that is wherein um, the, the, the organ, that is uh, the canal, the birth canal of the mother, uh, begins to relax and uh, uh, when it relaxes, then the head of the baby is trying to move out. Um, if you follow the diagram from top left, okay, you can see the baby is in a position that is ready to come out. Now, we have the next one, next, uh, the next diagram you can see, like I said, the, this is the dilation process. Uh, the bath is now happening, the second one. So the head of the baby is pushing out. Uh, of course, some interesting things happen there because like the baby rotates naturally on its own in a way that it will be easy and possible for the head of the baby to come out easily. So if you just follow the picture, let's come to the bottom left. You can see the head is uh, already out. And then next, the body itself is almost going out. And the final stage is what we call the afterbath delivery. That is wherein the placenta, remember we said, in the wall of the uterus, the placenta forms, and that was housing the baby, nourishing the baby and everything, so that comes out. But of course, uh, in some instances, there is some time delay between the delivery of the baby and that of the uh, placenta. But uh, immediately the baby is born, the umbilical cord is tied and cut. And then they wait for the placenta to come out. In some instances, assistance has to be given. So again, uh, more pictures to show you the different stages of uh, labor. Labor is um, the process and the pains that, uh, of course, mothers go through. And then, of course, the final birth of the baby. Uh, next, we want to look at the skeletal system. Um, there's a nice photo on the left showing you the arrangement of the bones in the body. The skeletal system simply refers to the bones of the body. We can see the skull, we can see the spine, the bones of the spinal cord. Uh, we can see the ribs and how they are all connected to form a cage. And you can see the bones of the arm. Uh, on the right, we have um, the, the, the full frame of the skeletal system. So the human skeletal system includes a network of tendons, ligaments, and cartilage. Now, Tendons and the ligament and cartilage all work together to connect the bones together. Um, if we look at the skeletal system, it has uh, some important function. One of them is to provide support. It provides the structural support for the human body. Um, we're able to stand because of the bones that are supporting us. If we didn't have any bone, it would be like if you take an empty bag of rice and you want to put it, it cannot stand on its own. But once it has the support it needs, it will be able to stand. Number two is that the skeleton protects our organs. Very important organs like the brain is protected by the hard skull there. If it wasn't there, a lot of us uh, things will go wrong. They protect very delicate organs inside our body like the hearts and the lungs and the other important areas. And even if you come around the um, hip area, uh, but the delicate reproductive organs for the females are protected there. Number three is that they produce blood cells. Some, some bones produce blood cells and they store uh, some of these blood cells until they are needed. They also store and they release or produce fats and the minerals. And the most importantly, our skeleton brings about movement. They do this by working together with our muscles. So you have to try to learn these four uh, important functions of the skeleton and you can research or search for more and add their support.
protection, movement, and the production of uh, blood cells and the storage of fats and minerals. So parts of the skeleton, uh, basically we divide the skeleton into two. The axial skeleton. Uh, this is the you know, main frame that is going down from the skull to the spine to the rib cage. And of course the two girdles. Huh? We have girdles at the top and the girdles at the bottom here. These ones we refer to as the pectoral and this one um, the pelvic uh, girdles. Um, so the bones that form the axis of the body are the axial skeleton. And the appendicular skeleton, on the other hand, is made up of the bones that connect um, these bones to the main frame. Okay? So it, simply the limbs, um, the bones of the hands and the bones of the legs. This, the, bone, the hands and the legs, we call them limbs. So these are the two divisions of the skeleton. Um, you will have to learn naming the parts, um, the skull, uh, important areas I'm naming. The skull, you come to the, the, I mean the, the ribs that form the rib cage. At the front here, uh, you have a flap of uh, bone, which, uh, which is the sternum. Uh, you come to the pelvis, okay, that is uh, the, where you have the pelvic girdle. Uh, you have the, the three sets of bones that are joined there to form the pelvis. At higher level, you'll be naming the pelvis, the ischium, and the pubis. At this level, just, just know them as the pelvis. Uh, when you go to the, let's go back to the arm, you have this bone that is the humerus, and then you have two bones here. Um, touch your elbow. Now, that is the ulna. And then this one that comes to the index finger is the radius. That's how you try to remember their names. The long bones, you have the femur, uh, the kneecap, you have the patella, or the kneecap, and then you have the bones of the leg. The big bone, the main bone there is the tibia, and you have a tiny one at the back, which is the fibula. Now, the arrangement of the bones in the arm, okay, uh, you have the carpals, and then you have the metacarpal, the bones of the palm, and then the phalanges. Uh, you will notice we science teachers sometimes will say, uh, put your phalanges up. It's not an insult. It's just referring to the skeleton. Uh, the similar thing is, pattern is repeated at the bottom. You have the tarsals, that is the bones at the ankle of the foot. And then you have the metatarsals, that's the bones of the sole of the foot. And then the phalanges, that is the digits, the toes and um, the toes of the feet. Um, uh, part of the skeletal system, we need to study the joints. <coughs> A joint is simply a connection that occurs between bones in the skeletal system. So wherever two or more bones meet, a joint is formed. Um, we have different ways of naming them, but among the basic ones, you have what we call the pivot joint. Let's look at number one on the top left. That is where in the skull is resting on the uh, spine there. They form a pivot joint. That allows us to make movement, for example, uh, if you remember when you're dealing with um, levers, talk about pivot, okay? The pivot provides a, a support about which the machine rotates. So your head is resting on the pivot, and in this instance, it allows you to rotate, you know, like you can turn left, right, and it also allows you to go up and down, okay? And number two, we have what we call the hinge joint. That you find in the elbow, and uh, where you have the knee. Hinge like the hinge of a door, it allows you to bend in only one direction. Uh, number three is the um, saddle, or that is more like the um, gliding joint, okay? Uh, your bones glide, huh? they, they simply um, glide in moving around each other, so they form the gliding joint there. And uh, number four is described as a plane joint. It's like, um, you have a flat plane and then you have something resting on it, so it allows the movement that way. And if you come to number five, is the ball and socket joint. Very important joint. You find them here, wherein the, the, the humerus joins with the shoulder. And then you also have one where the femur, that is the thigh bone, joins with the pelvic girdle. It's a very important joint because it allows you a lot of uh, rotation, a lot of movement. You do a lot of movement, you know, you can go up and down, you can go sideways, and you can even, you know, circle, circle around. 
And when you do higher science, uh, you need to know the names of all those movements, you know, this up and down, this way, and other movement. But very interesting that uh, we have all these type of joints. Uh, to help you understand them better is another diagram we've placed. You can see <coughs> uh, there's something we refer to as fixed joint. Let's look at the skull. You can see different bones that are joined there. And this is actually how an adult skull will look like. The bones are actually joined, but we cannot easily see that except if you remove the skin. And even there, sometimes it's difficult to see where the bones were joined. Now, when the baby was developing, these bones were not all joined together. And uh, it remains like that until the baby is born. That is to help birth to be easier because if the bones are joined in a fixed situation, in some instances, the birth canal is very narrow, very small. Um, it will be difficult for the baby's head to pass. But because the bones are not at that stage joined, uh, it makes them flexible so they can squeeze in and then the baby can pass through. But once the baby is growing, the bones grow and then they fuse and then they form a fixed joint. Um, uh, let's look, we can see the one they describe as the elbow joint um, on the right. That's actually the hinge joint. Below it, you have the ball and socket. That's the same. Uh, the knee joint is actually another hinge joint. Um, another example of ball and socket is the hip, I mean, they say hind limb joint, um, wherein the, 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 the femur is joined to the uh, pelvic girdle. And of course, the fore limb, that is, the, you have a plate, uh, you can feel a plate at the back, wherein you have this uh, bone that fits into that plate. So, those are more examples of joints. Uh, let us move on to the excretory system. Uh, this consists of the organs that remove metabolic wastes and toxins from the body. Uh, metabolic wastes refer to those wastes that are made when um, certain processes occur into the body, like uh, respiration. Waste is produced, water and carbon dioxide. These are examples of metabolic waste. Sometimes uh, when some proteins are broken down, you have metabolic waste. Sometimes some tissues of the body are broken down or chained to something, waste are produced. All this waste, if they stay in the body, they become toxins or poisons for the body, so they have to be taken out. Um, excretory system includes the removal of urea. Remember I told you, if you have amino acid, that is from proteins, the liver will break them down into urea and of course a form of carbohydrate. Now this urea is sent through the bloodstream to the kidneys and then they have to be taken outside. So at this level, we look at four main um, organs or systems that are helping in excretion. The urinary system, we've looked at it briefly, made up of the kidneys. You have the ureter that collects urine from the kidneys to the bladder, and of course the bladder itself and the urethra. I come to the skin, we've also briefly looked at the skin um, that helps to process waste in the form of sweat and take it out of the body. The lungs, they process, or rather they help us to take out carbon dioxide and some water vapor out of the body. Now come to the liver, like we mentioned, its function in this situation is to uh, make urea. That is, the extra um, amino acids in the body are broken down into urea. That is what it does, and then send it to the kidney, and the kidney is the gate that takes it out of the body. Of course, the kidney has a lot, many more important functions. Uh, among them is also to make poisons that are in the body to become less poisonous. Because if poisons travel through the body, they are going to, wherever they pass, they will be damaging. But once they get to the kidney, the kidney makes them harmless. So they can be traveling the body without causing any damage. And once they reach the kidneys, they are taken out of the body. But even though they are harmless, if they are not taken out of the body, they continue to build up and they become a problem. So this is why you might notice people with liver problem or kidney problem, they, if this, the problem is not fixed, they might uh, become sick and end up dying. So we go back to the excretory system. Um, again, we need to know the diagram. You should be able to identify it as the urinary system. You can see the name at the bottom there. Don't refer to it as the excretory system. If I take you back, the excretory system is all these other organs involved. The urinary, the skin, the lungs, the liver. It's a common mistake for some people to refer to this as the excretory system. It is the urinary system. 
the system that prepares or makes urine and take it out of the body. Um, so we have the kidneys and the ureters that are bringing the urine down to the bladder and uh, from the bladder to the outside of the body through the urethra. And um, don't forget the blood vessels there and the vena covered, colored blue, and uh, on the screen it's on the left. Um, and then the vena, uh, the outer on the screen you find it on the right. These are the ones that bring uh, the up, the outer brings the blood to the kidneys, and then once the blood is filtered, the veins will now take the blood away from the kidney. I uh, hope you remember this diagram, we looked at it before. Remember we said the kidney is made up of three parts. The outer part is the cortex and that is where the blood is filtered. That is where the blood is uh, cleaned. And then the clean blood um, is sent back to the uh, blood vessels. Remember I said the veins, they continue their journey. But uh, the filtrate, um, the things that are taken from the blood, the waste, the excess water, excess salt, they continue down to the middle part that is called the medulla. That's where you have those tubes. And then these tubes empty into the yellow portion you see. It's called the pelvis. So those are the three areas of the kidney. The cortex, the medulla, and the pelvis. You need to remember that. Now the pelvis is connected to the ureter that takes the blood uh, down, if you look at the left, to the bladder, bladder to the urethra. Now, how is filtration, or how is the blood clean? Um, if we take a careful look at this diagram, uh, it may look complex, but uh, let's try to make it simple. Um, blood enters each kidney by the renal artery. Uh, let me take you back. If you look at the diagram, you can see from the aorta, then you have a branch, that is the renal artery that goes to the kidney. So let's go back. So the renal artery, divides into smaller and smaller vessels until it becomes capillary. Now, these capillaries, you know, coil up to make a knot, and that knot is called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is surrounded by the kidney tubule, which is known as the nephron. Now, this is where the actual cleansing of the blood takes place, because once the glomerulus is um, inside the, the Bowman's capsule, um, filtration occur. What happens is everything that is in the blood filters down except the blood cells. All the water, all the salt, all the nutrients, everything filters down to the Bowman's capsule. And um, then the, for once they reach the Bowman's capsule, they continue down the tube. At the bottom you can see a um, network of capillaries, that, the, the, the red ones. Okay? Now they do what is called absorption. So they take back everything that is important. If the kidneys determine that you need some water, they'll take a lot of water. If they determine that you need salt, they will take a lot of it. Whatever they think is necessary for the body, they take. But the waste, they will continue. You can follow the arrows, the blue arrows. You can see how they go until eventually they go to what we call the collecting ducts. And the collecting ducts finally enter into the ureter. They all join up to form the ureter and then the, the waste is taken out. So two terms we must try to learn there. Filtration, that is filtering of the blood, and the reabsorption, which takes place in the, along the loop of Henle, that U-shaped structure, that is where all important materials are taken back into the blood. So this is how our blood is made clean or filtered. Skin, um, among its functions, include sensation that is uh, feelings, okay, feeling of heat, pain, and of course touch or nice, uh, uh, nice feelings. Uh, heat regulation, uh, body temperature. If you're, if the place is hot, your skin has some mechanism it does to keep you cool, and if the place is cool, it does the reverse to keep you warm. Uh, the skin helps us to absorb certain essential things. Uh, it, uh, it plays a very important part in protecting the body, okay? Of course, the entire body is covered by the skin, so that way the body is protected. Of course, uh, the important area we want to look at, is, at here is the excretion uh, that is carried out by the skin. Um, if we take a look, careful look at the diagram, you can see at the bottom, you can see the blood vessels coming around, and uh, you can see the sweat gland a little bit at the bottom. 
that is looking like some warm and that is where the blood is filtered just like we described in the kidney the blood is filtered and the excess material together with water and the salt and any waste they are taken through that tube and they go outside the body so this is the role of the skin in terms of excretion but of course you can look at the list here the skin does a lot of um, uh, other activities um, another important one is secretion you know, producing certain uh, important um, material that the body will need to use and uh, of course vitamin d production uh, you are normally told you need to have vitamin D. In Africa, it's simple. You just expose your body to the uh, sun, and there you have a lot of vitamin D. Once again, you need to know the parts of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and the fat or subcutaneous layer. You need to know that it's made up of blood vessels, uh, the hair follicle with hair shaft coming through it. Uh, you have erectile muscles, and you have the sebum, uh, sebaceous gland that contains sebum. You have the sweat gland and the sweat duct. You have uh, nerve endings that help us to detect heat, temperature, pain, and so on. So make sure you study the skin. We come to the endocrine system. Now the endocrine system is a network of glands in your body that make the hormones that help cells to communicate to each other. Um, the body works just like you will have in a town or in a family and so on. We all need to communicate to each other. Like I'm talking to you now. I'm using a medium. In the body, uh, one of, there are two ways the body communicates. One is by means of the nerves. Okay? Like you touch something, you're able to know you've touched it because the nerves help you to communicate. You touch something, the sensation is passed through the nerves, through your uh, body, and it goes to the brain. The brain helps interpret what you've touched, and you know you've touched something. Whether it's heat, like you sweat, step on hot charcoal and so on. But that's one area. The other area is the endocrine system that helps us to uh, communicate with different parts of the body. And uh, <clears throat> they release the substances they make into your bloodstream directly. So whatever they make is sent directly into your body. Again, you need to study this and uh, try to know the main or the positions of the uh, main organs, right? Um, the main endocrine glands. So if you go to the top, right at the top, there is a small dot in the brain there. It's a pituitary gland. Very important. Uh, next, if you come down around the voice box, you have the thyroid gland. So it's another important area. I will leave the thymus for now because you'll be dealing with that in the senior school. But uh, come down to where you have the kidneys. You can see yellow something on the kidneys. These are the adrenal gland. They're also very, very important. And of course, um, you can see the ovaries and down you have the testes. These are also um, endocrine glands. Now, like we said, these glands, remember, glands are made up of tissues. So they are organs, actually. They produce um, certain chemicals that are called hormones. And these travel in the bloodstream and they go to what we call target cells or target tissues. And they communicate to them. They sort of get them to do something is it to grow for example the reprodu um, the, the sex um, organs they get the body to grow into maturity in the case of girls like you see breast developing is because of the communication between the ovaries and the rest of the body or boys developing hair on the face it's because the testes have communicated to that those parts of the body so these are the four endo endocrine glands that uh, we are required to make sure we learn. The pituitary gland, uh, remember I told you, is that small knob in the brain there. Uh, it's called the master gland because it controls all the other glands. Then we have the thyroid gland that produces thyroxine. Now, thyroxine is a growth hormone. That means it controls how we grow. Uh, if you have too little, you grow less. If you have too much, you grow too much. Okay, so the pituitary gland is the master gland that controls other glands. The, um, the thyroid gland is the uh, gland that controls how we grow by producing thyroxine. The adrenal glands produce adrenaline. Now, this is what helps us to fight. You know, if you are in a situation where you need to defend yourself, you are prepared for fight. Your heart is beating, your, your, your lungs, you know, you're breathing hard. 
that helps to pump more blood and you get more energy and you're ready to fight. However, it also prepares you in a case you know you can't fight, you are ready to run away. That's the flight. So for example, as we're in this room now, if a lion comes, even though the door is closed, you'll see we break the door and we're out. And we also have the sex hormones. Um, from the testes in males, they produce testosterone. This is what makes the boy to grow into a man, you know, you, he has all the man things, huh? the facial hair, the, the hard, heavy voice and so on, masculine, tough, macho. And then the females, the ovaries prepares the woman to become a female. Um, they have estrogen, they have progesterone, and they have LH, that is luteinizing hormone, and they have FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. This is all to prepare them, um, make their bodies more feminine, and prepare their body for uh, carrying a baby and uh, of course feeding the baby with breast milk and so on. So these are four important hormones that we need to learn about. As I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the growth hormone, tyroxine, if you have too much of it, you overgrow. Look at the picture on the left. Um, the man on the right is the average man. Uh, the one in the middle is um, a giant because his body produces a lot of thyroxine so you can see he grew very very tall and uh, uh, that's uh, a very short man the dwarf man on the left okay so that shows you if you have too little thyroxine you grow less if you have too much you grow too much but if you have the average you grow like an average man uh, on the right you can see some dwarf people some of this is not just uh, because of the thyroxine problem sometimes it's the genetics um, is the, the genes that are passed on from their parents to these children next uh, briefly want to look at the nervous system um, this is simply our an other means of communication so we have the central nervous system that is the brain and the spinal cord and then we have the peripheral nervous system that is the branches that are coming from the spinal cord. The nerves help us to communicate with the outside world. Seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, everything that we're able to pick up is by means of the nervous system. Um, like we said, it is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. We looked at the brain earlier on, and uh, these are the important areas we should try to learn. The cerebrum, uh, that controls the sense organs, your sight, your hearing, your smell, your taste. These are all controlled by the cerebrum. It is also involved in thinking and the memory. Uh, next, we have the cerebellum, the yellow portion. Uh, that controls posture for you to be able to stand or sit or lie down properly and balance. So while you're walking or you're doing gymnastics, you're jumping and this and that, you're playing hard football, why don't you fall? It's because your cerebellum is working very well. Uh, next, we have the medulla oblongata. It controls um, odd system. That should be ODD. Uh, I mean, uh, body. It controls body systems and uh, processes that uh, we are usually not aware of. Digestion, breathing, respiration, and uh, your sleep and other things that the body carries out without you even knowing it is going on. Seldom do we think about breathing, except maybe you are involved in a fight or you're doing something strange. There you begin to notice you are breathing. But as you're sitting there now, you are not even thinking about breathing. But uh, you are required to know how to label the different parts of the brain. So take note of that. Now, finally, we want to look at the interrelationships of uh, some body system. Uh, we have already seen how the various bodies uh, parts work together to maintain um, a balance and uh, everything that is happening inside the body. So this maintenance of a constant internal environment in the body is what we refer to as homeostasis. It's a very important. It makes sure that the body environment remains at the normal. If your temperature goes up, homeostasis kicks into place and bring it to normal. Your temperature drops, it's too cold, your homeostasis kicks in and bring it to the normal. So every part of the body is linked so that um, the body is able to work in a very good way. Uh, the systems are linked and controlled by the nervous system and the endocrine system. Remember, these are the means of communication. The two systems achieve their control in uh, two distinct ways. 
Now, one, the nervous system works more like a telephone system. It's very fast, okay? Like a mobile. You want to talk to somebody in America, you call, Pam is there. So that's how the nervous system works. You put your foot on hot coal, immediately there is a reaction. Message is sent fast to your brain. You're able to move. They, so maybe you pick up a hot plate of uh, food. Before you know it, the, the plate is broken because the heat in your hand. That's how the brain is working. You don't have any control over that. Okay, um, the endocrine system functions more like a radio signal which is transmitted uh, to everyone with a radio, but only received by those people who have their radios turned on. So what we're trying to say here, it targets certain areas. It doesn't go to everybody. So they are specific in where they go when they are released. They move around the whole body, but until they reach the specific target, like we're saying, if you have a radio, if they speak to you, then only you would respond to that. Another example of the linking together of different systems is the linking of the circulatory, the digestive, and the excretory system. Let's take a look at the diagram there. Now, the digestive system, of course, is linked with the circulatory so that uh, they themselves get nourishment and uh, they're able to do their work and their finished product is sent to the circulatory system. And the circulatory system will take them around the body by means of the heart pumping them. And then the lungs too, the air they take in, oxygen is filtered and sent to the blood. That is also sent around the body by means of the circulatory system. And uh, after the cells have done their work, the waste are sent to the kidney for them to take them outside. So this is how the entire body is linked up. And uh, when you come to the reproductive and other organs, the whole body is a system, it's a network. Everything is working together. That's all today, folks, and uh, we hope you've learned a lot from this. But uh, the best way for you to learn is to go back and uh, review your notes, check your textbooks, the grade 7, 8 and 9 textbooks, everything is there. And uh, so you can uh, be at a better advantage. And don't forget to check past papers. We've said this, we cannot overemphasize past papers. They show you how questions appear and uh, you can see questions relating to some of these things we've said and that will help you to learn. So once again, my name is Mr. Kuraish and uh, my colleague here is Ka Carlos. So Carlos Calon is my colleague. He's been doing a very good job in helping our audience to follow our discussion. Thank you all.